Hi everyone. This is Angelie Grantham. I am presuming that we are now live on Facebook. Um, oh, hooray! There is all indication to say that indeed it is now live. This is great. My name is Angelie Grantham. I'm the curator of statewide services at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau, and I want to thank the Hange, thank the Hain Sheldon Museum for. Um, allowing me to be live on Facebook today. Um, my job is to support museums across Alaska. And one really fun way that I was able to do that this year was to develop a traveling exhibit called Alaska's Suffrage Star. And as it sounds, Alaska's Suffrage Star features the story of women voting in Alaska. Um, this exhibit is actually in Haines right now. However, because of the current COVID-19 situation, all libraries, archives, and museums in Alaska are closed. And so today I'm hoping that this uh, little presentation is an opportunity for you to learn about the history of suffrage in Alaska. And I hope that eventually you will be able to see this exhibit in person. Um, so the reason that we are talking about suffrage this year is um, that we are currently in 2020, which is the centennial of the 19th amendment. It was in 1920 that um, the constitution was amended to say that um, that sex was no longer a qualifier for voting. So that is to say it's women had the opportunity legally to vote across the country. So we're celebrating that centennial this year, 100 years of women being able to vote across the US. The fact of the matter is, is that Alaska at that time, Alaskan women had spent seven years voting already. <laughs> it was in 1913 that Alaskan women achieved the vote. Alaska, um, at that time there were 1913, there were already nine states in the West that allowed women to vote. And so suffrage, even though the movement got its start philosophically, intellectually, politically, as far as organizing on the East Coast, its earliest victories were on the West Coast. In 1920, Alaska was not yet a state. So that means that Alaskans weren't able to vote to ratify the, uh, the 19th Amendment. However, we had previously achieved that victory. Um, so it's been such a joy to be able to spend many months researching this topic, trying to understand through what are really scant records, how it was that women achieved the vote in Alaska in 1913. And today I'm gonna share with you some of the um, suffrage stars as we're calling them, some of the women voting right, rights activists from the 19 teens and 1920s here in Alaska and uh, some of the discoveries that, that I made along the way as to how women in Alaska achieved the vote in 1913. So um, there, like I mentioned, this is a difficult thing to, to document and, and to research because 1913 is when Alaska's territorial legislature first started. And the right to vote is um, at its nature, a political act. So before 1913, if women in Alaska wanted to vote, there was no place for them to advocate for that right because no one in Alaska was voting outside of municipal level elections. So it's hard to find any documents that look at earlier voting rights activism because it's not as if there was a legislature for them to be advocating to. Um, so the question has been, how did this happen? And often I think one of the answers has been is this idea that Alaskans were just really progressive at the time. And this um, is somewhat depicted in this political cartoon that was published in, in the Tacoma Ledger. Let's see if I can get this right. Um, in Tacoma, Washington, right after the vote was achieved here in Alaska. You can see here is the, legis the legislature personified as a, a man, right? Giving suffrage to the woman of Alaska. This is in contrast to what was happening in London at the time. And there you could see men sneering and abusing um, the suffragettes of England. And so this is a way of showing the civilized nature of Alaskans compared to those of the British. Uh, quickly, I wanna clarify throughout this pr presentation and, and through what you'll see a lot about the history of suffrage in the US, American suffragists, but that's what they were called. They, they weren't suffragettes. Suffragettes um, indicates that the British and the English movement for voting rights in the US are suffragists. 
So this idea of the progressive Alaskan, I think, has been what's dominated our, our thoughts about how women achieved the vote in 1913. And while that's somewhat the case, it's not entirely the case. The origin of women achieving the right to vote in Alaska um, in 1913 actually is in Washington, D.C. It was the U.S. Congress that opened the door for women to vote in Alaska. So I'm going to take you back to 1912. 1912 Alaska is not even a territory. We have uh, a governor appointed by the president, and we had a congressional delegate who would be sent to um, represent Alaska within the Territorial House Committee. Um, so we really have no political representation and Alaskans were tired of it. So for years, Alaskans advocated to become a territory. And finally, in 1912, Congress assented. So um, that was the year that the Second Organic Act became federal law, which created the territory of Alaska. The Second Organic Act then was presented on the House floor, the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. And when senators had the opportunity to vote, uh, or, or excuse me, representatives had the opportunity to vote on this legislation, it opened a debate about women's suffrage. Um, Soon after the debate started, someone um, presented an amendment and, and the amendment would have immediately enfranchised Alaskan women. Um, however, that amendment was defeated. A second amendment was put forth on the House floor and that was to um, include something within the Second Organic Act that said that the new legislature could enfranchise women if it so chose. And there was vigorous debate on the House floor about this. That in itself is significant because yet again, this is eight years before the passage of the 19th Amendment. This gives you a sense as to the fact that suffrage was the talk of the country even back then. This was also an opportunity for representatives to, um, to announce themselves as being suffragists themselves. There were representatives at that time who were in Washington, D.C. because women had voted for them. Because at that point, there were nine states already who had achieved, uh, that had achieved suffrage for women. So um, this debate on the House floor was an opportunity for some of these men to um, advance you know, the, their suffragist causes. And it was also an opportunity for other representatives to publicly announce that they were not uh, supportive of suffrage. However, after this vigorous debate, the amendment passed. And so when the Second Organic Act was signed into law, there was a provision that said that the territorial legislature could enfranchise Alaskan women. So the only reason that, that women were able to achieve the vote in Alaska was because the House of Representatives opened the door to it. Um, and yet again, this is a big moment in the history of suffrage in the country because this debate happened on the House floor in Washington, D.C. So Alaskans are thrilled. Not only are they going to be able to vote for a territorial legislature, but women know that the, the door had been opened to them. I'm gonna read a letter that uh, Judge James Wickersham received from a Skagway woman named Emma Lefevre. Judge James Wickersham, he was the territorial, or at that time, we were yet yeah, we're in a territory, but he was the delegate to the House of Representatives from Alaska. And this letter is dated June 25th, 1912. It reads, Honorable James Wickersham, my dear judge, you never did a wiser or juster thing than to stand by the women of Alaska, just as they have stood by you during these years of trouble and uncertainty. Women have their faults, but ingratitude is not one of them. We have waited in silence to see if the men of Alaska would not do us justice when Alaska shall gain her rights and let us stand by their sides and help make good and just laws for our beloved country. But do not forget when that happy time comes, the best that Alaska can offer will be for you. In the name of the women of Skagway, please thank the noble men in Congress for their vote. We cannot crown them with laurels, but deep down in our hearts, we will keep their memory green. Sincere, sincerely yours, Emma Cooper Lefevre. So Alaskan men were able to then go to the polls um, in that November to cast their first votes for who would represent them in the first territorial house and first territorial Senate. Um, it was mostly men who voted. However, there were a couple of women who also voted. Note, this is before it was legal. 
One of these women was Nellie Cashman. We're calling her Alaska's first woman voter. Nellie Cashman is an important figure beyond the fact that she was Alaska's first woman voter. She was a stampeder who took part in almost every major gold rush from um, Nevada to Arizona um, to BC. She saved a bunch of um, miners that were in Stikine country from scurvy. She packed a whole bunch of uh, fresh fruits in on a dog sled to save them from scurvy. She then went up to the Klondike. She um, went to Fairbanks and uh, was successful there. And then she became a miner off Nolan Creek and she operated the furthest North gold mine in the world in 1912 and 1913. By that time she was um, already elderly and um, Nellie Cashman, even during her life, was well, well regarded and known as a successful miner, entrepreneur, boarding house operator, restaurateur, and a philanthropist. She uh, gave the seed money to develop the first hospitals in Dawson City and Fairbanks, and her, um, her generosity was legendary. And so um, Nellie Cashman was a well-read woman with contacts all over the country. She uh, likely had heard about um, the fact that Congress had opened the door to voting for women. And when it was time to vote for that first territorial legislature, she marched into the polling place and cast her ballot. Um, a couple of other women in Nolan followed behind her and cast ballots as well. And uh, the person who was um, there manning the polls at the time just pretty much couldn't say no. I mean, what we, we could not say no to Nellie Cashman, this well-regarded, um, and well-respected woman in Alaska. So Nellie became Alaska's first woman voter. She's one of our suffrage stars. So suffrage was clearly the talk of the country at this point. We have the House of Representatives discussing it on the House floor. It's in newspapers constantly. Um, and uh, it's, it's worth noting that um, when, the first territorial legislature gaveled in, the first day that the legislature gaveled in was March 3rd, 1913. That's the first day that the legislature ever met. And this is a program from the women's suffrage procession in Washington, DC. It was happening at the very time on the very date that Alaska's territorial legislature was founded. Um, this was the largest political march in the history of Washington up until that point. Tens of thousands of spectators came out to watch this theatrical procession of women from ac across the country um, advocating for their vote, uh, uh, for the right to vote. Um, this was an important movement and an important moment in the history of suffrage in the country. Um, after this, the National American Women's Suffrage Association really started to focus on a federal amendment to guarantee the vote across the country. Um, and so um, this was happening right when the legislature was meeting here in Juneau for the very first time. Alaskans, um, now that we had this legislature, here we have members of the first territorial house. Alaskan women rallied. Um, they quickly uh, organized to advocate for suffrage. The National American Women's Suffrage Association sent telegraphs and letters to all the newly elected men in the House of Representatives and, and Senate, uh, the, this local um, Alaska uh, uh, House and Senate, that is. And these letters included five women, why women, five, five reasons why women should be granted the vote. Um, women in local communities spoke with these newly elected representatives and talked about suffrage. And the fact is, is that a lot of these men didn't need any convincing. They were suffragists already. They had come from suffrage states. Um, some of them had previously served on other states' legislator, uh, legislatures, um, including some that had previously voted for suffrage in other states. And so most people didn't really need a lot of convincing. Women in Knick, led by Cornelia Hatcher, um, gathered uh, signatures for a petition Women in Seward did the same thing, and these petitions arrived in Juneau right in time for the introduction of two different suffrage bills. HB2, House Bill 2, was um, introduced by Representative Shoup of Sitka, 
And another companion legislation was introduced on the Senate side as well. So um, people across Alaska, men and women, were strong advocates for suffrage. And here is um, a letter that, an editorial that came out um, right before that first session in the Alaska Daily Empire in Juneau. It was dated December 4th, 1912. And the editorial read, let the women vote. We are told that the first territorial legislature of Alaska will be asked to tackle the woman suffrage question and give the women of the territory the opportunity to cast their votes with their fathers, husbands, and brothers. There is no adequate reason why the women of Alaska should not be permitted to vote on all questions. In other words, they should be given full and equal rights with the male sex in the matter of voting. Nine states of the union have, en have enfranchised them and in none of the states where women have been voting for years do people desire a change. Therefore, let the women of Alaska have the right to vote. They will use it with as much intelligence as the average man. So due to this, um, due to this advocacy on the part of Alaskan men and women, HB2 became law. Not only did HB2 become law, that is extending the, the right to vote to regardless of sex, it was the first bill that the territorial legislature ever passed. So that is saying something. The first bill ever passed in this state today was to enfranchise women. And HB2, it was an act to extend the elective, elective franchise to women in the territory of Alaska. And this is the text of it be it enacted by the legislature of the territory of Alaska that in all elections which are now or may hereafter be authorized by law in the territory of Alaska or any subdivision or municipality thereof, the elective franchise is hereby extended to such women as have the qualifications of citizenship required by male electors. That was approved March 21st, 1913. So congratulatory telegrams um, flowed into the uh, to Alaska, to the governors, to these representatives, and people across the nation celebrated the addition of Alaska's star to the suffrage flag, as they would say. However, you might have noted um, within that last bit of the law, it says that the elective franchise is hereby extended to such women as have the qualifications of citizenship required by male electors. Not all women were considered citizens at that time. Citizenship was limited. Um, for example, Alaska Natives and really no um, Native Americans, very few at least, were considered citizens at that time. It took until 1924 for the Indian Citizenship Act to be passed at a federal level, which guaranteed the right to vote to uh, Native Americans. Um, as a result, when um, HB2 was signed, it was immediately limited in uh, who it was that could vote because of these qualifications of citizenship. The history of suffrage in this country and the history of voting rights in this country, when you uh, read about it, it's, it's never just black and white. There are so many gray tones in this story. It's a story of constant advances and then retractions. Um, it really is uh, not just the straightforward path of progress. And we see that to this day with the continuous challenges to voting rights in this country. Um, it's really important to note that two days before HB2 was signed, another bill was presented to uh, the legislature. And it was, um, it was a bill that uh, in a way seemed to present, present pathways to citizenship for Alaska Natives. However, these pa this pathway to citizenship required them to renounce all of their tribal relationships for white citizens to, uh, to swear that they had um, abandoned their cultural uh, life ways and their relationships with tribal family members. Um, and in many ways, it, it was um, a pathway to citizenship that made it so that any person that took that pathway um, had to renounce entirely their native culture and family. And so although it was a pathway, it was uh, a very treacherous and, um, and horrible pathway to achieve the vote for Alaska Natives at that time. 
Um, that bill, a version of that bill, actually became law in 1915 in Alaska. So um, that meant that there were Alaska Native men um, and women who, if they went through this, um, this naturalization process, could vote. Um, additionally, citizenship at this time wasn't even guaranteed for um, white American women. Um, a woman's citizenship was dependent on her husband's. So if, uh, if an American woman, a white American woman, um, married someone from a country uh, or married even, a, let's say, an Alaska Native who would not have been a qual qualified as a citizen, the woman would lose her citizenship as well and thus her ability to vote. And so a woman's citizenship was tied to that of her husband until 1931. Um, the, there are some, one of the important women in the history of voting rights in this country, or excuse me, the state, and I'd say this country too, is Tilly Paul. Let's see if you can see, there we go, Tilly Paul. There she is with her son, William. Tilly Paul is uh, an incredible woman in the history of Alaska. She's a, a Clinket woman from Wrangell. She taught um, in Sitka for many years. She translated, she was one of the first people to translate and create a Clinket dictionary. Um, she was a Presbyterian minister, and in 1922, uh, her relative, um, uh, Chief Shakes, went to the polling place in Wrangell to cast his vote, and he was turned away, even though he had gone through this complicated naturalization process. Um, when he was walking out of the polling place, Tilly asked what happened, and, um, and he told her what had happened, and so she marched back in there with him and demanded that he he'd be able to vote, as was his right. Um, both Tilly and Chief Shakes were arrested. And, um, and Tilly was arrested for encouraging a person who was ineligible to vote to vote. Um, eventually, the charges were dropped. Um, and, and so th there was no further legal action. Um, however, it's uh, it's, uh, it's a story that's really important to remember because even though some people had gone through this complicated process of naturalization, they were still denied the right to vote. And uh, Tilly Paul is an important voting rights activist for what she did to, to stand up to, um, to the uh, people in the polling place and, um, and advocate for voting rights for her community. So 1913 HP2 was quite the victory. However, it was a limited victory. Um, there are some interesting impacts of, for um, HB2 in Alaska. So let's, I'll quickly talk about some of the um, impacts of suffrage in Alaska. Uh, it was in 1914 that Mary A.C. Gibson of Ketchikan ran for a territorial house. Ms. Gibson was the first woman to run for um, a territory or statewide position in Alaska. She ran as an independent candidate and she did not win, but uh, she campaigned on um, two positions. Number one, uh, expanding women's rights and number two, ending fish traps in Southeast Alaska. Uh, that for uh, soon after that um, women's property bills were advanced in Alaska, um, assuring that women would have access to property following um, marriage and divorce. Um, in 1916, this incredible woman, Lena Morrill Lewis, became the first Alaskan woman to run for federal office. She ran to be congressional delegate against Judge James Wickersham. She achieved about 10% of the vote, didn't win. But this woman is, is uh, important nationally, actually. Um, she was a, a prominent socialist. She was the first woman to serve on the National Committee of the Socialist Party. And she convinced the National Committee to, um, to support women's suffrage across the country. That meant that the Socialist Party was um, the first major political party to support suffrage in this country. And it was because of really of Lena Morrill Lewis. She happened to be living in Alaska, organizing unions, mining camps, and loggers um, in 1913 when um, HB2 was passed. And so uh, she um, lived in, uh, Anchorage and Fairbanks and Juneau and traveled all over the territory, um, organizing workers, running newspapers, educating people on economics and socialism. 
Uh, and she's just a really phenomenal uh, character in the history of um, Alaska and the history of socialism in the U.S. actually. So she, so she was the first woman in Alaska to run for federal office in 1916. Soon after HB2 passed as well, women started on their next major political campaign. Um, and here you have the leaders of the Women's Christian Temperance Union of Alaska. Um, here, this side right there is Cornelia Hatcher. Cornelia is one of the women who um, organized signatures for a petition that was sent to the legislature in 1913. Cornelia as well is nationally significant in the temperance movement. She was the editor of the Women's Christian Temperance Union's newspaper before she moved to Alaska. She met Robert Lee Hatcher um, in Seattle. They fell in love and they got married. So she moved up to, um, to the Matsu Valley. Um, Robert Lee Hatcher's claim became Independence Mine and Hatcher's Pass or Hatcher Pass is named for him. Um, and his wife, Cornelia Hatcher, is, is historically significant in her own right. So Cornelia um, had been engaged in um, suffrage activism and temperance activism for many, many years before moving to Alaska, where she um, then advocated for the passage of HB2. And then soon after women achieved that vote, the Women's Christian Temperance Union started in on um, spreading on prohibition. Um, and if you can believe it, uh, it's incredible, but in um, 1916, because of the effective campaigning of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Alaskans voted overwhelmingly to enact prohibition in the territory before national prohibition. Um, so that gives you a sense as to how effective these women were at campaigning. Um, so these were some early um, impacts of suffrage uh, advancements of women's property bills. We have women entering the political arena. Um, and so there were many positive things that, that happened. However, it's important to note that it wasn't until 1937 that the first woman was actually elected to uh, the territorial house. And that was Nell Scott Chadwick. 1937 is uh, 24 years after the passage of HB2. And so even though women could vote, they still were not able to achieve um, the political position of men. And it, it's also really sad to report to you that the first woman to be elected to federal office was Lisa Murkowski. Um, so we've made great advances, that's for sure, but we still have a long way to go to think that it took until the 2000s for a woman to be elected uh, as, to the federal office to represent Alaska. So, um, this story of suffrage then is a story of um, victories, of persistence, of incredible women, but also of setbacks and disappointments. Um, and and it's like I said at the beginning, it's just been a joy to be able to uh, resurrect the voices of some of these women like Tilly Paul, Lena Mora Lewis, Cornelia Hatcher, Nellie Cashman, um, to see all the work that went in for, for decades to advance women's rights in this country and to recognize that the only reason that um, women in Alaska were able to achieve uh, the vote is because of the decades of advocacy and activism that had taken place in the rest of the country. So Alaskan women really benefited from um, all, that, all that work by those women for all those years. Um, I really hope that um, everyone out there is healthy and secure, and I hope that we're able to um, come out of this and you'll be able to actually go and see Alaska Suffrage Star, this exhibit that uh, the Sheldon Museum is hosting. Um, and I'm happy to answer your questions. So please um, ask below in the comments um, and I'm, I'm gonna sign off for now, uh, but thank you everyone. <laughs>